If you're anything like me, you'll have the experience of reading a philosophy essay, one you enjoy, one you actually understand, but then all of a sudden, a section appears with a load of mathematical formulae. You've reached the Bayesian probability section, and your eyes glaze over, and you think, oh, I dropped maths for a reason. Well, in this video, I want to talk about how we can do Bayesian probability visually using a method that I learned from John Hawthorne. Before I let you in on the secret as to how to think about Bayesian probability visually, I've got four preliminaries to run through. The first is that the argument I will use, which is the problem of evil, is meant as an illustration only, and so I won't be going into it in any detail here. The second is that I won't really spend any time justifying the numbers or probability assignments that I give in the argument, as that would take us into the details of it. These are somewhat arbitrary values that I use for the sake of illustration, so try not to get too hung up on whether you think they are accurate. Third, I'm not going to discuss different interpretations of probability, such as frequency, propensity, and degrees of belief interpretations. And finally, we're going to think that something is evidence for a theory if it raises the probability of that theory being true, and something is evidence against a theory if it lowers the probability of that theory being true. Now, if you want to learn more about these preliminaries, then I will be doing some future videos on them, so do remember to subscribe. So in order to think about Bayesian probability visually, we're going to introduce something called the Bayesian bar after the Reverend Thomas Bayes, who came up with Bayes' theorem. And the Bayesian bar is just a rectangle. What's important about the rectangle is its surface area, as this is our total probability space and has the value one. This is because it contains all our different probabilities and we're certain that at least one of them is going to be true. We can now split the bar up into further probabilities. So let's imagine someone who is what we'll call a perfect agnostic about God's existence, since they're 50-50 as to whether God exists. So for this perfect agnostic, we can designate half the bar to represent how likely they think it is that God exists, which we'll call theism, and the other half to how likely they think it is that God doesn't exist, which we'll call atheism. Now imagine our agnostic has never considered any evidence for theism or atheism. There are a number of different types of evidences that he could consider, but suppose he starts by thinking how likely or not the existence of God would be if there's evil in the world. Imagine he starts with the theistic half of the bar and asks himself, suppose God exists, how likely would it be that there is evil in the world? Maybe he thinks that because God is all-powerful, all-knowing and wholly good, the existence of evil doesn't seem very likely at all. But perhaps he also thinks it's not impossible that God and evil exist together, and so he gives three quarters of the theistic portion of the bar to theism and no evil, and a quarter of it to theism and evil. Now he starts to think about the atheist portion of the bar and thinks, suppose God doesn't exist, how likely is it that there would be evil? This time he thinks it's pretty likely that there would be evil if there's no God, because there's no being like God trying to prevent it, and he thinks it would be pretty unlikely that there would be no evil in an atheist world. So he gives three quarters of the atheistic portion to atheism and evil, and a quarter to atheism and no evil. The next step is to think about these different probabilities in terms of the whole bar, rather than just the theistic and atheistic portions. So the probability of theism and no evil in terms of the whole bar is three-eighths, of theism and evil is one-eighth, of atheism and evil is also three-eighths, and of atheism and no evil is also one-eighth. And if we add up all these individual probabilities, we get the value one. Suppose now our agnostic comes across some evil for the first time. This gives him some evidence, namely that evil exists, and as a result the bar is going to change. What he now needs to do is remove two portions of the bar where it says there is no evil, since he has found out that there is evil. So both the theism and no evil and atheism and no evil sections must go, 
Because of this, he is a bar which is smaller than the one before, but the probabilities of this bar must also add up to 1, since it now contains the whole probability space, and at present, they don't add up to 1. So he's going to have to perform a process called renormalization. This sounds more complicated than it is, and it's just the process of changing the values of the remaining probability segments whilst preserving their ratios. So this means that because the atheism and evil section is currently three times the size of the theism and evil section, it must also be three times the size after this process. So the probability of theism and evil changes from one eighth to one quarter, and the probability of atheism and evil changes from three eighths to three quarters. So this gives our perfect agnostic his final probabilities. Given the existence of evil, he now thinks the existence of God, theism, has the probability of a quarter or 25%, as only a quarter of his final bar is taken up by theism. On the other hand, he now thinks that atheism has the probability of three quarters or 75%. In other words, whilst there might still be a God who has chosen to allow evil, it's more likely that God doesn't exist given the existence of evil. The overall result is therefore that evil is evidence for atheism. And the reason for this is that evil raised the probability of atheism from a half, represented in our initial bar, to three quarters, which is represented in our final bar. And evil decreased the probability of theism from a half, again represented in our initial bar, to a quarter, as we can see in our final bar. So before I end this video, let's go through one more example. And this time we're not going to put any values on the bar, so you can see that the Bayesian bar works just visually on its own. So let's again think about the problem of evil, but this time the person we are going to be thinking about is someone who thinks that theism is really likely and atheism is not that likely. So now we're going to have to split up the theistic portion of the bar further, remembering that we're assuming this person is assigning probabilities in a vacuum so before they have any evidence that evil does or doesn't exist. Again, we're going to think a lot of the theistic portion is going to be for God and no evil, because we think that God wouldn't want there to be evil in the world and would try to prevent it. And then the remaining part of the theistic portion of the bar is going to be for God and evil. And then on the atheist side, maybe this time we're 50-50, that is, we think that atheism and evil is kind of just as likely as atheism and no evil. So now we add in our evidence that there is evil in the world, and so we remove the portions of our bar where it says there is no evil, so theism and no evil, and atheism and no evil. And so we're just left with a bar that has just theism and evil, and atheism and evil. And you can see our final probabilities just by looking at the bar. So the question now is, is evil evidence for theism or atheism? The answer to this is going to be atheism again. And that's because atheism is now more probable than it was to begin with, and theism is less probable than it was to begin with. And remember, we are thinking about evidence as probability raising, and so evil raises the probability of atheism. And this is the case even though in our example theism is still more probable overall, since it takes up the biggest portion of our bar. So that's how to think about probability visually. In a future video, I'll talk about how the Bayesian bar relates to Bayes' theorem and how the actual formula maps onto this visual bar. So if you don't want to miss out on that, then remember to subscribe, and if you've found this video helpful, then please give it a like.